Hello and welcome to Integrated Pest Management for Private Applicators. We hope that this will help you have a full understanding of the material that you need to know for your PAC exam. Remember that you still need to use your uh, study guide for the new exam in order to be able to be successful on this exam. Let's get started. So we're going to cover what integrated pest management is, types of control methods that are used, what's the actual goal, what are key versus secondary pests, all about pest biology and identification, types of pests, and also resources for identifying pests. All right, let's start with what is IPM or integrated pest management. It uses the knowledge of pest and host biology, as well as biological and environmental monitoring to respond to pest problems by using tactics and technologies which are designed to do three important things. Prevent unacceptable levels of pest damage. Notice we're not saying eradicate the pest. That is not a goal of IPM. We want to prevent unacceptable levels of pest damage. We're going to minimize the risk to people, property, infrastructure, natural resources, and the environment because we're not going to be using the heaviest hammer we have. We're going to be using lots of different types of techniques in conjunction. We're going to reduce the evolution of pest resistance to pesticides and other pest management practices. Um, if we get too heavy handed with uh, certain pesticides, then we actually are inducing pest resistance. So what is IPM um, in, in a simple definition? It's a science-based approach, right? And we're going to combine a bunch of different techniques and methods uh, we're going to study the life cycles of pests and how they interact with the environment. Um, and then we're going to use some different types of control measures. This uh, slide is, does a really good job of talking about kind of like the different steps of IPM. So if we go around the circle here, starting with number one, step number one is to identify what the pest is. We need to know exactly what we're dealing with. And then we need to monitor that pest. And you can do that with trapping um, and just direct observation uh, in your vineyards, say. Um, and then you need to evaluate what you find. Uh, what are the results from this monitoring? And how can it help us answer questions? So are we getting a lot of damage? Is it time to act? Um, as pest numbers increase uh, toward what they call an economic threshold, then it might be time to treat. So an economic threshold simply means we have reached that point where the damage uh, to the crop is such that we can't take that on a sustained basis. We have to we have to do something. All right. So prevention pest problems can be prevented by using resistant plant types, uh, planting early, crop rotation, using barriers, sanitation methods, even the uh, uh, sealing cracks in buildings for uh, structural um, pest control. So prevention is always like the first line of defense, right? Uh, prevention uh, and exclusion of pests uh, from where you don't want them. Um, action. IPM uses all kinds of tools to reduce pests below, oh, there's that word again, an economically damaging level. We're not going, we're not trying to completely eradicate them. We're trying to get them to a, a level that we can handle uh, or sustain. A careful selection of preventative and curative treatments reduce reliance on any one single tactic. Um, and that greatly increases the likelihood of success. And we're back to monitor. So you keep monitoring. And if the uh, pest pressure remains low or decreases, then further treatments might not even be called for. Um, but if it increases and exceeds that threshold again, well, then we have to go to another IPM tool. So the types of control methods, these uh, control methods are, are ones that you'll need to understand what each one is and does. So biological control is the use of natural enemies, uh, predators, parasites, pathogens, even competitors to control the pest. 
Um, a good example of that is um, when the County Ag Commissioner here in Napa sends folks out and we um, release anagyrus wasps to control the vine mealybug in vineyards. Does the wasp go out there and parasitize each and every VMB? Nope, but it does enough that it can really help reduce that pest pressure. Uh, cultural control. All that means is stuff you do that reduces the establishment, reproduction, dispersal, and survival of pests. Uh, for example, changing an irrigation practice might be one way to reduce a pest problem. Uh, too much water can increase root disease in weeds, for instance. Um, but mechanical and physical control can control uh, a pest directly. It just blocks it out, makes the environmental uh, environment unsuitable for it. Uh, think of like rodent traps, um, and maybe you have seen some of the large um, barriers along riparian areas to keep the blue-green sharpshooter out of uh, vineyards. That's a nice mechanical or physical control. Um, we're seeing more of that um, as the time goes on. Uh, so you know, more examples of physical control might be mulches for weeds, steam sterilization of the soil. Um, oh, there's the barriers again for the uh, uh, along riparian areas, but I think um, primarily where you see it is to keep birds and insects out. Uh, we use a lot of netting on the uh, vineyards here in Napa. So chemical control, well, that's it. That's that's the use of pesticides, okay? That's, that's finally we get to the point where the uh, action threshold or the economic threshold has been met and it's time to drag out the pesticides. So we only use them when they're needed and in combination with other approaches. That's pretty much the key term for IPM. You only use pesticides when you have to, and you use them in combination with all of these other control methods. Um, pesticides are selected and applied uh, to minimize possible harm, and you'll use the most selective pesticide that's gonna get the job done and be safest for all the other organisms and for the environment. Um, for instance, you can use pesticides in bait stations rather than sprays or spot spray weeds instead of the entire uh, valley floor. Right? So there's lots of ways to reduce the use of pesticides by the way that you do it. So we talked a little bit there about biological control and it's just that use of natural enemies. In fact, the anagyrus wasp I was talking about uh, a couple minutes ago there is right here on the left. Um, does a great job of helping to control but not eradicate the vine mealybug. Um, and the um, little uh, ladybug beetle there is also a, uh, a frequently released predator um, and it does a terrific job on aphids. Great picture. All right, cultural control. So tilling can reduce some pest populations while attracting others. So it's important you know how your target species that you identified and monitored responds to tillage and what other pest tillage might put you at risk of attracting. You need to have the full picture. So if tillage is timed with the stage of the pest life cycle that is underground, it can be used to directly control insect pest populations. And on the right hand picture there, you see that sanit sanitation and cleanliness around your yard and the orchard, other growing areas, removing weeds, um, any type of favorable area that an insect would love to live or overwinter and reproduce is certainly going to help reduce that pest population and possibly um, reduce your use of pesticides because of it. Um, so this is a picture of that rodent trap I was talking about. I love that picture. Um, there's no bait in there and boy that mouse is just running in. Don't think we'd see that very often. Um, on the right you see a screen covering um, a garden uh, crop works great. Um, and that's just a good example of mechanical or physical control. All right, we're all the way to the end with chemical control again. Um, and this is our um, you know, method of last resort, but obviously we know that sometimes it's got to occur. Um, so the, the whole goal of IPM is that we want long-term sustainable pest suppression 
with low impacts. And you remember I've already said this uh, several times, not eradication. So the hallmark of IPM is that you can do it for a long time. It's sustainable long term. We are suppressing pests, not eradicating them, and we have low impacts because we're using a combination of methods. Here's an important concept. And it's important that you know, we remember that when we use um, normal uh, pesticides and we use them too much or we just use them um, in the wrong way, we can create some real problems here. So a key pest is one that's causing major damage on a regular basis. Okay, that, that's easy to remember. So what is a secondary pest? Well, because of misuse or overuse of certain methods, um, uh, secondary pests occur because of the action that you took to control the primary pest. Let's take a better look at that. You can see in the picture um, that the little green um, ant creatures are representative of a natural enemy like that Anagyrus wasp, say, and the orange one is a key pest. The black one is the secondary pest that is now surging as a result of the method of pest control you use. So when a pesticide is applied to control one pest and it kills the natural enemies or the introduced enemies that were keeping a second pest population in check. Um, a lot of predators can be helpful in keeping aphid populations from reaching damaging levels, but the broad spectrum insecticides that are used to control key pests are highly toxic to the aphids too, right? So that might lead to a resurgence of a, uh, or, or a um, emergence of a secondary pest. Um, as a result, applying the insecticide leads to secondary outbreaks of aphid populations or other populations of insects. So a large jump in population happens when the pesticide kills off the natural enemies, along with the target pest, and it's called pest resurgence. All right, fun facts about insects. Um, there are insect species that act as both pests and natural enemies. Um, that makes sense. Um, it's kind of like the way nature works, right? So a good example of these uh, insects would be thrips and also um, other bug types that are called true bugs, uh, uh, excuse me, hemiptera. And um, it's kind of an odd term. Um, some of you might not have heard that term before unless you were biology majors, um, but it, you know, what, do, what, do you, what do you mean it's a true bug? Um, is there such a thing as an untrue bug? No, it's not the, it's not the way you want to take that, that term. True bugs are just a class of uh, insect like the stink bug shown here that have certain classifications, kind of like this shield-like um, outer structure. Um, you can kind of get the picture um, right here of what a true bug might look like and probably think of several species off the top of your head. Um, but the important thing to know is that true bugs and um, some insects like thrips um, are both uh, predators uh, and natural enemies and they are um, pests in and of themselves. Um, kind of an interesting thing. Um, good to know about um, where IPM fits in with that predator and um, pest relationship. Uh, sharpshooters. Everybody here is probably familiar with this one. Uh, they can definitely cause harm to crops and can transmit diseases because they're chewing um, on uh, plants utilizing piercing uh, mouth parts to feed on fruit or plant sap. Um, and aphids are also known to transmit uh, diseases to plants in the same way. Um, it's not that the damage is because they're eating up the plant. It's not that they can transmit diseases by chewing on the plant. Um, that is where the harm comes in. Um, and it's not common here in Napa, um, but it's important to know that um, almonds, uh, stone fruit and citrus trees, along with walnuts, are the most likely to be damaged by scale type insects. Um, probably some of you might have fruit trees at home and you're probably doing battle with scale insects there um, on various scale, uh, you know, on various types of them. Um, but we don't 
really see almond trees here much, but we do have plenty of walnut and I, the stone fruit and citrus are in a whole lot of people's yards. Um, and I'm sure some of you have plenty of it uh, infested by scale. Um, what is pesticide resistance? Resistance occurs when a pesticide exhibits reduced effectiveness, right? It doesn't control the pest anymore um, at that formerly effective rate. Um, and why does that happen? How does that happen? Well, pests have this really brief lifespan on this earth, right? And they, they develop really rapidly. They don't go far uh, and they generate this high number of offspring. Um, and so the pest, like a mite in this picture, eats a plant. You do a pesticide application and the individuals that were just by chance genetically most resistant will survive that application. Um, and by surviving, guess what? They're the ones that thrive and reproduce. And now you do another pesticide application down the road um, and those resistant individuals again reproduce and over time we develop pesticide resistance. So pest biology and identification is important um, because remember that was your first step in integrated pest management. Identify the pest and then we start to monitor it and then we determine uh, what kind of damage is uh, being done here. So all right, we can identify it and we need to research the biology and understand that life cycle and then we can start moving forward from there. But, you know, how do we identify that pest? There's a lot of different ways to do it. Um, but once you have the information, you can develop a pest control plan. You want to make sure you monitor it, right? And then you can control it at its most susceptible life stage. That's important. You don't want to try to control that pest when it's at its strongest. You want to try to control it at its most susceptible life stage because it will probably uh, use less um, strong um, methods. So the IPM component that's most likely to enhance the efficacy of pesticide applications uh, is that monitoring process. We've heard that a few times now. So how do we identify that pest? Well, there's some resources for you out there. Um, UC Cooperative Instant, uh, Extension, CDFA, they even have a lab that can help you out. Um, and the uh, UC IPM um, Integrated Pest Management Program has wonderful information um, and lots of um, pictures to help you identify pests. We can help you identify pests here at the Ag Commissioner's Office, and we use all the same resources as um, you. Um, <clears throat> this is one you might not know about. Um, it's pretty old fashioned. Um, it's pretty much uh, professional entomologists that use um, this technique. I certainly remember doing it in college. Um, what is a dichotomous key? Well, we all know that, you know, di means two. So what we're doing here is we're kind of going down an if then uh, chart. Um, take a look um, at the uh, picture on the left. So if we want to identify um, what these insects are, it's like, all right, are the wings covered by an exoskeleton? Uh, if so, go to step two. If not, go to step three. Is it a round shape or is it an elongated shape? You see what I mean? Uh, if then a uh, table on the right, it shows a good example of that too. Large wings or small wings? long rear leg, short rear legs, and these go on for pages. I don't think you're likely to use one of these yourself. Um, however, it's important that you know it exists and that it is um, an important resource for pest ID. What do we use? Google or your favorite search engine. We're not uh, um, recommending one over the other, but there are a lot of great pest ID resources on the internet. Um, and uh, that's actually a really good place to start is to look at um, images. Uh, and there's like bugguide.net. There's all kinds of wonderful resources on the internet um, that you can use. So what the heck are weeds? <laughs> They're invasive for sure, right? Um, but what makes them a problem? They're a problem because they're competing with your crop for water, nutrients, light, 
and space. Yep, that's a problem. Um, they can also be poisonous to livestock. They can obstruct drainage canals and they can house lots of other unwanted pests. Um, <clears throat> you'll notice on the right there, there's a difference between summer annuals and winter annuals, hence the name. Not too difficult there. Um, but let's take a look at the other pest types. <clears throat> so you've got invertebrates. We've been talking about them a lot. Animals that do not have a spine. They are invertebrate. So um, arthropods, insects, nematodes, microscopic worms, snails, slugs, all that fun stuff. So who are the vertebrates then? The ones that do have a spine. <clears throat> I think most of us know intuitively who that's going to be. Birds, reptiles, amphibians, fish, mammals. Um, and it's important to know that um, pests um, that are really commonly found on livestock but not on plants are stuff like ticks and lice. You know, they're kind of in a group of their own. Um, sure, you can find ticks on plants, but are they a pest on plants? Well, maybe to us when we go hiking, but they're not a pest to your crop on plants, but they are certainly a pest for livestock, ticks and lice. Um, disease and disorder types. Uh, this is a whole nother category. Um, think of uh, plant and animal diseases that can be caused by pathogens. A pathogen is simply a disease causing organism such as fungi, bacteria, viruses. On the right, you see what's called a gall, um, G-A-L-L-S, um, and it's filled with mycelia caused by fungi pathogens. Um, so, you know, if you've never seen one of these before, that's what you're looking at. You're looking at a thing called a gall um, that is caused by fun uh, fungi pathogens, and um, mycelia um, is a, um, a pathogen in itself that can cause a, a damage related to fungi. Um, so a disorder is caused by non-living or abiotic, meaning without life, factors such as nutrient deficiency or uh, contaminated water. On the right is an example of a um, <clears throat> disorder caused by contaminated water. So I wish that I could answer your questions, <laughs> but this is a recording. Um, and I do hope that um, as you read your study guides, um, some of this information will uh, kind of jump out at you and say, oh yeah, I remember that. <laughs> That's our hope. Um, so from here, we will move on to the last portion of the PAC workshop, which is a quick little session on how to interpret um, labels.